Good morning, all the audience in the Netherlands, as well as uh, good afternoon for all the audience in the uh, Indonesia. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to these sessions where we will discuss various developments of hydrogen economy, both in the Netherlands as well as in Indonesia. And we are glad to have the practitioners, policymakers, and academicians from both countries who will present their experience and ecosystems in both countries, either it is in upstream or in downstream value chains of hydrogen economy. So we have a, a line of uh, practitioners, academicians, and policymakers. And I would like to welcome the uh, first speaker today. So basically, we would like to organize the sessions as presentations from the speakers. And we would like to hold uh, short discussions towards the end of the sessions, where you can ask questions by posting questions on the Q&A. Or you could also uh, uh, post questions also in a private chat to me if it is possible. Uh, the first speaker of today, we will have Gerte de Jong, who is the program manager of the Heaven project in the Northern Netherlands, where Heaven stands for the hydrogen energy applications in valley environments for the Northern Netherlands. So I think she will uh, share her experience first of our activities in the north and it will follow up later with the experience from Indonesia. So I think Gerte, without any further ado, I'd like to give the floor to you, Gerte. Thank you, Bayou. I will try to um, get my presentation on screen. So one second, please. And it is having a hard time, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so I'm having a small problem with sharing my screen because it is blocked. Um, one second, please. Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, so today I'm going to present to you about Heaven, our project in the Northern Netherlands. And let me just put it on the big screen. Yes. So today I will tell you a little bit about Heaven. How is the project structured, um, the four clusters that we are working in, and the work packages, and how we use communication, dissemination, and how it can inspire and help new valleys and other environments to create a, a hydrogen valley as well. Bio already said hydrogen, uh, Heaven stands for Hydrogen Energy Applications for Valley Environments in the Northern Netherlands. And our goal is to create an integrated green hydrogen infrastructure, so one working uh, system where you will see production, transportation, and use, uh, research, and replication all in one project. Heaven is also recognized by the European Commission as the first official hydrogen valley of Europe, and it was even mentioned by President von der Leyen as a very positive example of uh, one of the initiatives in hydrogen. Our financial scope is around 85 to 95 million based on European and regional and national subsidies and also co-financing. Um, why is the Northern Netherlands such a good place for uh, a hydrogen valley to take place? Uh, we have a really large and uh, extensive existing gas infrastructure because of course the Netherlands uses a lot of natural gas already. So it's very easy to use those same pipelines or pipelines next to it to also start using hydrogen. We have a lot of access to large offshore wind farms in the North Sea, most specifically, um, we have two very large chemical clusters around uh, very much in the North, Delfzijl, Eemshaven, and around Emmen, which you will see in the clusters later on. Uh, and there is a big wish, especially from uh, politics, to decarbonize urban mobility and to really start uh, building an integrated hydrogen economy. So these are the partners that are participating in Heaven, and you will no doubt recognize some of them. For example, Shell and Total Energies are, of course, very big 
uh, international players, but there are also many smaller com uh, companies. For example, Bytesnet is a data center nearby and Uvo is a very small taxi company. So it's both very large international companies and smaller, uh, um, smaller, even some of them are one person companies and also municipalities are participating knowledge centers the university of Groningen is also participating um, and one of the i think one of the big strengths of heaven is the cooperation between all these different partners and that they get to to know each other and to see each other we are of course supported by uh, european union a european uh, Commission and the province of Groningen and province of Trenton. So how are we structured? Here you will see the four clusters and I will talk you through it because just from this picture, it might not be clear right away, but we will go through them one by one. We have four clusters that are um, divided either geographically or in terms of subject that they are uh, implementing. And then we have some work packages that are researching uh, basically the results from the cluster. So the clusters are really the groundwork. Cluster one is very much focused on uh, Delft, Zell and Eemshaven. So the um, industrial cluster in the very north of the Northern Netherlands. And some things they do are uh, building a large infrastructure pipeline from one of the uh, existing 20 megawatt electrolyzers called Jules. Uh, they are connecting it to a hydrogen hub that is also filling refueling stations. And one of the very interesting projects, I think, is they are building uh, a hydrogen refueling station to fuel boats. And one of these boats you see here, this is called Antony. And Antony is a fully electric cargo ship that will uh, be able to sail on hydrogen. And it will sail between Groningen and Rotterdam, where it can also uh, refuel hydrogen. So that's a very interesting project. Mm, uh, Min Minister Harbers has even uh, officially started this project. And here you see it in Rotterdam. It's a, a very large barge boat, completely powered by hydrogen. So that's, I think, a very interesting project within heaven. Cluster two is focused on the built environment. And this is to find out if hydrogen can be used to heat houses and buildings, either uh, completely or as a backup power source or as a partial power source. And also hydrogen storage in salt caverns is part of this cluster. Here you will see one of our housing projects in Hogeveen, where they're being very ambitious and want to heat uh, over a hundred houses on hydrogen, um, where the hydrogen boiler sits directly in the house. It even made uh, Fuel Cell India magazine, which we're very proud of, they did a, a special feature on the Hogeveen housing project. And currently they have developed a tiny house where participants and people living in the urban area can come and see how that would work in their house to really take away any feelings of nervousness or um, doubt and to show that they can heat their houses on hydrogen. And this tiny house travels around so that uh, everyone in the country can see uh, how it can be done and how you can heat your house on hydrogen. Cluster three is focused around uh, the MTEC, GTEC chemical park, where they are building uh, an electrolyzer, a hydrogen refueling station, and laying pipelines mostly for use by industry. And the hydrogen refueling station is used by buses that are also within the Heaven project. And you can see them here. They are buses from Cubas, and they are uh, taking in hydrogen from the MTEC uh, hydrogen refueling station. This was one of our first successes within Heaven, and we were very proud to, uh, to deliver that. And cluster four is mostly focused around mobility, where several partners are purchasing cars, either for their own use or to lease out. Uh, municipalities are buying vehicles, for example, street sweepers or salt vehicles. Um, and also there is a lot of interest in uh, heavy duty vehicles, of course, trucks. Uh, and to see if they can, if it's able to run them on hydrogen as well. So on Groningen Airport Ilde, uh, we also have a multi-fueling station where uh, uh, both 
cars, but also for now drones and maybe in the future, even uh, smaller planes could fuel. So those are the clusters. We have the work packages, they are called four or five and six, and they are really studying the work that is done within the clusters and uh, to see how they can replicate it, how it's possible to scale up, what is the business model um, uh, and how does the market react. Uh, so those are really studying the work that's being done in heaven, but they're also preparatory studies. And this is one of the studies that was done with Efrim Urstavas from the uh, University of Groningen. Uh, one of the big studies that was released, the Green Hydrogen Energy System, and this is open data as well. So you can, uh, if you're interested, you can look it up or you can click through from my presentation when it's sent around later. A uh, different study that was done was into the ship, the ship that we saw earlier in cluster one, and they did uh, a study, of course, on the design specifications of the fuel cell powered barge boat. There was a study done um, about how we can heat a data center by using hydrogen and how that should take place, how, uh, how the design should look. Uh, there's a study into heavy duty transportation and also um, a study done by NG into a 100 megawatt electrolyzer. So those are just some examples of the studies that have already been delivered, but there are about, I think, 20 studies in total being done within the Heaven project. And of course, we're not doing it alone. We are very well connected to other valleys. And the line you see, uh, the, right, the red line going through Germany and into the north is a new valley that's being emphasized. It's called the cross-border hydrogen valley. And then that would encompass all of Germany uh, going through Poland and into the Baltic states. So that is a very interesting um, follow-up maybe of the Heaven project. All the yellow dots that you see that are other hydrogen valleys and the green dots that you see are valleys that are really connected to heaven. So that are uh, partners that we're working with. And of course, we work really hard to spread the word as well. We have many uh, delicacies uh, coming over. Uh, for example, you see the delic delicacy from uh, Korea. Uh, you see people coming in at Gazuni, um, people from Japan, from Namibia, Quebec, Canada. We have uh, had so many visitors from all over trying to uh, learn about what we do. And also we want to learn, of course, from other companies from other countries. So that's why we're also very happy to present here at the winner conference. Um, I think that's my final slide. So thank you for your attention. We do have a website, of course, if you want to know more and also feel free to email us at any time. Um, we would be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. So uh, thank you, Geerta, for the nice presentations about Heaven, which I'm uh, very proud of because we are also part of the ecosystems and we are happy to see the uh, integrations of the hydrogens at least in the Northern Netherlands, which allows us to expand our renewable energy uh, portfolio in Europe. And uh, with that, then I would like to uh, connect to the uh, next speaker, uh, who is uh, Pro, uh, pa Rahmat Mardiana. He is uh, currently the Director of Energy, Telecommunications and Informatics at the Ministry of National Development and Planning. Uh, he was previously uh, Deputy Director for Risk and Tariff Analysis at the same ministry. He held uh, a PhD from the University of Indonesia and his area of expertise is on the public-private partnerships, electricity and communications. And I would like to give the floor to uh, Rahmat Madiana to present about the development in Indonesia and whether we are able to learn a bit on the uh, hydrogen economy in Indonesia. Pa Rahmat? Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning and uh, good uh, afternoon. Uh, I think from uh, the Netherlands and uh, Indonesia. I think uh, maybe someone uh, could help me to uh, upload the presentation. Okay. Um, we want to share. Uh, about uh, 
the uh, hydrogen uh, economy in uh, Indonesia and this is I think uh, we still uh, need uh, to uh, develop uh, more uh, and uh, maybe uh, later uh, Bu uh, Enia will uh, add uh, what uh, Brin uh, is uh, doing uh, right now have been doing uh, related with the uh, fuel cell but uh, in this occasion uh, we want to share uh, about the, uh, some of the uh, report especially from uh, our office and also from the uh, Ministry of uh, Energy uh, Mineral uh, Resources especially for uh, how we uh, achieve uh, net zero emission in 2060 uh, and also we want to share about uh, several uh, initiatives uh, conducted maybe from uh, for, from the uh, Indonesian uh, institution uh, maybe line ministries or government institution uh, and also uh, some of uh, state-owned enterprises including the uh, uh, cooperation with the private uh, entities next slide please uh, i think uh, this is uh, what we want uh, to achieve uh, before uh, our uh, decade uh, 100 uh, years of uh, our independence that we want to be uh, one of the high income countries uh, before 2045 uh, so i think uh, we uh, have uh, to grow maybe on average uh, around six uh, percent uh, from uh, now 2000 to 2045 and uh, we believe also uh, with the COVID uh, so the growth in 2020 is uh, contracted uh, around 2.07 uh, percent uh, and we can uh, grow uh, our economy uh, in 2021 uh, around 3.7% uh, uh, and uh, we will uh, try to do the uh, economic transformation and uh, to pursue uh, Indonesia as uh, one uh, high income countries. Next slide please and we develop uh, also six uh, strategies uh in this occasion maybe it will be related with the uh, strategy number three uh, related with the uh, green uh, economy with uh, low carbon economy and circular economy blue economy and uh, energy transition uh, and also uh, it will be related with the uh, uh, economic sectors uh, productivity uh, especially for the industrialization that needs uh, maybe uh, need for the energy and uh, also uh, the hydrogen uh, for uh, the input uh, for the uh, process. Next slide, please. Uh, this is what we believe uh, the value chain of the uh, green uh, hydrogen. Uh, it can be produced by uh, renewable energy and uh, digitalization. Uh, maybe can be. Uh, for the mobility and for the uh, heat uh, and cold uh, and also for the in the for the industries especially for the food and beverage and steel industries and for the uh, chemical uh, in this industry uh, especially for the uh, fertilizer and uh, we believe that uh, this is uh, quite uh, diverse uh, about the uh, value chain of the uh, hydrogen. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, we believe also that to develop uh, further uh, hydrogen uh, as uh, input uh, for uh, the economy, I think there are several uh, policy uh, question that should be uh, answer I think in terms of the technology that the hydrogen is still new and also in terms of the uh, manu manufacturing uh, we need also about the uh, 
uh, research and development policy uh, focusing on manufacturing costs, uh, efficiency and uh, flexibility of the use and in the of the storage uh, and transportation i think it will be need uh, large scale storage and uh, transportation uh, option uh, for the uh, hydrogen uh, it could be uh, through the pipeline or it could be through the uh, ships or to truck uh, and also we need uh, storage things and in the fuel cell uh, we still uh, also to consider about the uh, support uh, in term of the uh, manufacturing cost and uh, efficiency and in the uh, stationary uh, application uh, maybe we have to uh, consider uh, also uh, the uh, ecosystem uh, for the domestic energy supply uh, and generation power uh, plan and also for the uh, infrastructure i think uh, because this is a new infrastructure uh, i think the it will uh, have to consider about the financial burden and the standard also uh, because this is still a new of the technology a need for uniform international uh, hydrogen specific technical standard uh, for plants and uh, equipment and uh, in the uh, energy sources and fuel also uh, we need the creation of the appropriate uh, incentive uh, system to uh, push or to uh, attract uh, the investment uh, for the uh, hydrogen and uh, next slide please uh, i think based on the valuation uh, and also uh, based on the uh, emission uh, of the co2 uh, by sectors i think uh, we have uh, three uh, uh, sectors uh, that uh, emit uh, pollution uh, dominantly uh, in the uh, industrial sector uh, in the electricity sector and in the uh, transportation uh, sector and we believe that uh, we can uh, pursue uh, especially for uh, these uh, three uh, sector uh, to get the opportunity uh, for the hydrogen as a uh, uh, source of the uh, energy okay next slide please i think this is uh, we uh, summarize uh, one of the report uh, from the Bavanas, uh, it's uh, released in 2021. It's related with the low, low carbon development uh, initiative that uh, it stipulated that uh, net zero uh, emission uh, is estimated uh, to be reached in 2060. And in that uh, report, uh, LCDI consider hydrogen uh, only for the uh, transport uh, sector. Uh, and in the next slide, please. I think this is the draft of the uh, net uh, zero emission uh, roadmap from the Ministry of uh, Energy uh, Min and Mineral Resources uh, released in 2000, uh, 2022 in, and, and still uh, draft that uh in this uh, draft uh the scenario is uh, outlined in uh as a roadmap for the energy sector in indonesia uh, and it uh, basically uh, considered the use of uh, hydrogen power sector but uh, also refers to uh, the potential use of uh, co-firing uh, in the uh, coal uh, power plant uh, with ammonia uh, for uh, power generation and as uh, energy source uh, or uh, raw, raw materials in the fertilizer and uh, steel uh, industries okay next slide please and we are uh, currently uh, is conducting also a study uh, with the USAID uh, is it related uh, to study about the 
uh, utilization or the adoption of the green uh, hydrogen uh, in Indonesia and uh, as a key findings uh, we believe that uh, potential sector uh, priority in the power generation especially for the uh, off grid uh, connection uh, and uh, co-firing and in the uh, transportation uh, for the maritime and uh, heavy duty or long haul uh, transportation and uh, in the industry i think in the uh, ammonia uh, as the raw uh, material for the or uh, input for the fertilizer so i think uh, based on that study uh, we believe that uh, the uh, as the champion, I think, to support for the uh, industry, and we uh, identify also the main barrier. Is it including the cost of the uh, electrolyzer uh, and also uh, the problem, uh, the issue with the uh, infrastructure? Okay, next slide, please. I think. Uh, based on that uh, study and based on that uh, report, I think we need uh, supporting uh, policies, uh, especially for the uh, electrolysis uh, to get the first, I think, to get uh, for uh, electrolyzer uh, capacity uh, in order to uh, inform the private sector. Uh, to attract the investment uh, and also uh, tackling uh, high uh, capital costs, maybe to the government loans, capital grants, and other uh, form of the financial uh, assistance, and also improving a scheme for the electrolyzer, uh, paying a premium for green uh, hydrogen, ensuring additionality of uh, renewables generation, uh, increasing uh, support for the uh, research, and for the infrastructure, I think uh, several uh, supporting policies that uh, will be uh, needed, kicking off uh, international cooperation on uh, global uh, trading of the hydrogen uh, because of the uh, problems of the uh, transportation. And uh, then identifying uh, priorities for uh, hydrogen uh, blending uh, limits, uh, also aligning standard and blending uh, targets uh, among uh, networking countries, uh, and also the financing infrastructure uh, development in terms of the infrastructure. And in terms of the industry, uh, getting uh, ambitious uh, long-term uh, GH, G, uh, emission uh, reduction target uh, and also planning uh, pace out uh, high uh, emission uh, technologies and providing loans grant uh, or uh, dedicated funds uh, recognizing the value of green products uh, kickstarting uh, markets for low uh, carbon product and also cross-border uh, adjustment or uh, tax uh, rebate Okay, next slide, please. I think in this slide, we want to share also about the uh, hydrogen development initiative in Indonesia. There are uh, several uh, initiatives. I think in the uh, Sumatra Island, Island, there is a green uh, ammonia uh, at uh, Iskandar uh, Muda uh, fertilizer uh, and also in the uh, Semangke is one of the uh, special economic zone uh, hydrogen uh, from uh, geothermal uh, sources in the Sarula block and also a uh, pilot project for green hydrogen uh, for uh, kremasan uh, combined uh, cycle this is between uh, PLN and uh, Mitsubishi and also a pilot project for uh, green hydrogen uh, for the use in the uh, propylene uh, unit uh, this is uh, conducted by uh, pertamina and also in the java island uh, there is uh, initiative uh, green uh, ammonia or green hydrogen at kujang uh, cikampek and uh, pilot project for uh, co-firing ammonia uh, for Gresik uh, 
uh, Paul uh, Pyre uh, Power Plant. This is uh, conducted by uh, PTPLN and uh, one of uh, PTPLN subsidiary PT PJB. And then uh, pilot project for green hydrogen production at uh, Plumpang. This is conducted by the uh, Pertamina. I think for the uh, fuel uh, cell, uh, electric vehicle, oil trucks. And uh, in the Sumba, uh, we have a pilot project of the hybrid of solar, PV, battery, and uh, hydrogen uh, conducted by the HDF. And in uh, East uh, Nusa Tenggara is pilot project for the maritime sectors conducted by the Ministry of uh, Transportation. And uh, in the uh, Sulawesi, uh, there is uh, also clean fuel uh, ammonia. Uh, and uh, in the uh, Kalimantan, uh, green ammonia uh, conducted by uh, PT Pupuk, I think it is for the fertilizer. And also uh, in the uh, East Kalimantan uh, industrial uh, processing facility uh, to produce uh, green uh, ammonia. I think uh, maybe next slide, please. I think this is the conclusion uh, what we have uh, learned uh, so far. I think the first uh, it is important uh, setting uh, the right uh, priorities for hydrogen use. Indonesia will be the essential for its uh, rapid uh, scale up and long term impact. Uh, and also uh, decarbonization uh, ambition are the key uh, driver uh, for uh, the hydrogen uh, and uh, hydrogen development and deployment strategy should also uh, consider the different uh, driver to uh, intervene uh, where action can be more uh, effective. It could be for the power generation, it could be for uh, co firing heavy duty and long distance transport application, and also the production of clean uh, ammonia. And uh, we believe also that uh, uh, Indonesia or uh, the hydrogen market in Indonesia will face the three uh, stages uh, technology. Uh, the first is the technology readiness, uh, the second uh, market penetration and uh, market uh, growth. I think, uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, what we want uh, to share uh, about uh, especially for the uh, initiative that uh, several uh, line ministries, uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, and also the private entities uh, conducted uh, so far uh, in Indonesia related with the uh, uh, power, related with the uh, uh, green uh, ammonia uh, as uh, raw material or as uh, input in especially for the uh, fertilizer uh, industry. Thank you. Thank you, Parahmat, for the uh, descriptions about the development of a hydrogen economy in Indonesia. As you have mentioned that although there is not yet a roadmap specifically for the hydrogen, uh, we have seen as well that uh, within the net zero emissions uh, ambitions of Indonesia, the aspect of hydrogen has been included there and uh, there are already a number of pilot projects which you have uh, also described uh, earlier. I think this is a nice uh, transition to our next speaker, Professor uh, Lorenzo Squintani, who is a professor of energy law and the director, the first director of the Wubo Oko Schools for Energy and Climate at the University of Groningen. Uh, he's also the founder and member of the managing board of the Like Me Living Lab, which studies how to improve the effectiveness of public participation practices in the field of energy and environmental matters. I think without any further ado, uh, Lorenzo has a lot of uh, contributions to our university, and I think I would like to give the floor to Lorenzo to describe about, uh, about this. Thank you very much, Bayou, and a good day to everybody. Uh, I'm here to speak about the Hydrogen Valley Campus Europe and how it is, uh, can contribute to the development of the hydrogen economy. Now, we have here today, Geert is speaking about the Heaven project, the, Heaven, the Hydrogen Valley in the Northern Netherlands. Now, the Hydrogen Valley Campus Europe builds upon that project. Uh, basically, the, the 
core idea of this initiative is to make sure that next to the many developments that are necessary in order to sustain the development of hydrogen and, and the production, distribution and the supply chain, you need also men power and what we have seen in the in the past year in the north netherlands thanks to projects such as heaven thanks to the attention from political institutions is that there are many projects that have been created many facilities that have been being created to support both the testing and research in the field of hydrogen but also the training of the men power yet these initiatives are at the moment divided across the region they do not communicate each, uh, with each other a lot so the Adige Valley Campus Europe aims in the first phase of its development to bundle the various forces that already exist in the, in the North Netherlands in order to create new synergies, in order to allow the various systems to communicate with each other. And you are seeing here on the slide some of such facilities, such as uh, those uh, um, at uh, Esrik and Entec, where also Bayou is sitting, so within the University of Groningen, you see the entrance center, which is this campus uh, located very near by the, uh, the building of Hesrig and Entec, uh, where you can really go through the various facilities necessary to sustain uh, the hydrogen economy from production to consumption, from electrolyzer to um, heating pumps in the in the in-house so in order to, um, the, to, to heat the building environment, and where students can train their skills in order to then enter real market and sustain the hydrogen society. Uh, of course, you have to realize that in order to achieve the hydrogen economy only in Netherlands, we will be needing 25,000 professions. And I'm speaking about technicians for a great part, but also the indirect uh, jobs. And I am a lawyer, professor of energy law. You will need also a lawyer to grant the permits in order to authorize the project that is necessary to build the hydrogen economy. So with the Hydrogen Valley Campus Europe, we aim at using the testing and research facilities once bundled in order to meet, enhance the education programs of the various knowledge institutions and you have to see that both in terms of interdisciplinary collaborations so technical uh, social sciences and uh, even uh, arts uh, coming together to train the, the, the human power of tomorrow and also uh, in in the sense of multi-level education because of course we are now speaking mostly at an academic conference we have a lot of uh, academic um, uh, colleagues are presented but you need the support from all level of education in order to really uh, spur the development of the hydrogen economy so in the hydrogen valley campus europe we are bundling the power between um, university uh, applied sciences and vocational study um, institutions in order to create educational programs that can really help um, developing the hydrogen economy at whole level of the of the value chain but this is not an easy undertaking um, you have to realize that in order to change the programs of a university you have to go through several rounds of accreditations and therefore in the other Valley campus europe we are developing um, two pillar uh, or two uh, speed i would say program one short term by means of extracurricular activities from um, undergraduate to uh, postgraduate in order to train and retrain the new manpower. And once again, bear in mind, uh, vocational, applied, and university levels should be there. And on the other side, with the, the slower track, we are trying to um, en en enhance and reform both bachelor and master programs in order to uh, broaden up the scope of the educational offer that we are um, developing here in the Netherlands. And uh, in this sense, we are going to work even more with challenge-based education, societal challenges brought forward with our societal partners. Because in the Adige Valley Campus Europe, we want to really to enhance the private-public cooperation that already characterized the Heaven Project and the Hydrogen World Project, which is the first cooperation in the field of education uh, related to hydrogen that we have developed here in the North, in order to make sure the societal partners can deliver uh, their challenges to knowledge institutions which can translate it into the educational programs combining students from the various level of the education column and, and vocational applied and, um, and academic research. Uh, in order to do so, 
it is required to create a structure, a kind of governing body, in which the various participants of the Hydrogen Valley Campus Europe, um, both private and public, can meet together in order to align their program, share experience, and uh, um, make sure that there is a common strategy in order to carry forward such um, uh, initiatives. Um, what is um, the phase now of development is basically is that in the coming two years we will complete what we call the consolidation phase, the bringing together the various assets and program, making sure that they are linked with each other through ECT facilities, but also to uh, regulatory programs. Eh? You remember also to sharing data, you require to uh, align the privacy and data security pro uh, programs of the various institutions in order to really allow interoperability. And uh, um, to further build up, then uh, we will uh, um, we will enter the phase two in which we will upscale the existing facility, integrate what is still lacking in our uh, both testing and educational uh, programs. And, uh, and finally, in the third phase, we will also enter the phase in which we will create entrep entrepreneurship uh, program in order to help our students to develop startups and upscaling and also, also to assist the MKB in order to um, cope with the and MKB stands for uh, small and medium size um, uh, industry in order to help small and medium sized industry to cope with the challenge of, on the one hand, understanding how to use the hydrogen technology to um, um, create more sustainable uh, business uh, processes, and on the other end, also to achieve the the quest uh, to fulfilling the quest of uh, attracting the right staff in order to work in uh, with such uh, technologies. Um, in total, the program will uh, run for at least uh, 15 years, and then it will pave the way to the new green molecule that will be developed in the in the in the meanwhile in the meanwhile and uh, um, should have a uh, total amount of uh, of reach of about 150 euro and of course this program does not only look at Groningen it, the north netherland is the geographical scope of the hydrogen valley campus europe but the hydrogen valley campus europe aims at becoming a point of connection for collaboration with international partners i'm speaking to the, today from bremen uh, where i'm attending the hydrogen expo and where yesterday I had a very nice talk with the rector of the university of bremen to setting up partnership in the field of hydrogen and similar talks are ongoing with partners from Denmark, Finland, Norway, and also outside uh, the, the northern part of the European Union with Spain, with Cyprus, and more outside of Europe, also with um, countries in the, um, Africa, from, uh, uh, from um, Egypt to uh, South Africa, and in, uh, in the Middle East, and also in uh, India, as well on the other side of the Atlantic, with uh, United States uh, institutions and uh, Canadian institutions. So that we will create a network of these uh, Hydrogen Valley knowledge uh, institutions to support the Hydrogen Valleys that we will be developed across the world in the coming, uh, in the coming years. Now, I hope that my brief presentation provided you enough insight and inspiration for an engage into discussion and follow up um, and meeting up uh, potentially in, in the field of uh, um, empowering humans to contribute to the energy economy, to the hydrogen economy. So thank you much uh, for your attention and bio, I give you the words back to you. Thank you, uh, Lorenzo, for uh, the uh, presentations about the importance of uh, human capital in the uh, preparations for the upcoming uh, hydrogen economy, which is also an important element there. And I think not only human capital, we also need the technology for that. And I think this is nice transitions to the next speaker who will be presented by Professor Enia listiani Devi, who is a currently a professor of electrochemical process at the Agency for the Assessment and Applications of Technology or BPPT in uh, Indonesia, or now is becoming a part of BRIN Yes, I'm sorry about that, Professor Enia. And uh, she's also currently uh, uh, working with various projects within the brain related to the hydrogen technology. And I think without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Enia to, uh, to give uh, discussions about uh, this aspect. Professor Enia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Enia. I'm active professor in National Research and Innovation Agency. We call it BRIN. 
And for today, uh, thank you for inviting me to talk to the winner. And then I will uh, show you about the hydrogen energy for especially in the petrochemical industry in Indonesia. Uh, now uh, we will start about the uh, this talk with the uh, out, the president's statement. And in last year in UK uh, on the event of uh, COP26 uh, to accelerate the net zero emission that would be uh, on the 2060 for Indonesia, uh, he he said that uh, we have a financial platform to uh, invest uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we have innovative uh, financial for climate, especially. Uh, we also want to implement the carbon market price and also the carbon tax, tax and uh, green ecosystem of uh, on our industry. And what he do? He uh, the government itself accelerating the implementation of uh, electric vehicle. We have also a biofuel. We have also accelerating the photovoltaic, and then we also consider about the hydrogen that we will talk today. But in fact, on our uh, national contribution of the uh, net zero. Um, I'm sorry, on the renewable energy uh, contribution on the uh, energy mix in our country right now, uh, it just uh, to be calculated with the 11.4%, for, for, uh, which is on the 2025, we will achieve to the 23 percentage contribution of uh, renewable energy. Now, we just only have uh, three years from now, uh, would, be, would become to 23 or not, it's depend on our uh, accelerating of the implementation of this uh, scenario. And then, of course, uh, consider about the uh, emission. The biggest one is from the transportation and industrial sector. We must say the carbonization is a must. So the president also wants to stop the first steam power plant until uh, 2045, and then it want to introduce the nuclear on grid by 2050, and then uh, want to create the electricity and the hydrogen and ammonia society. And of course, uh, if, if we're calculating the CO2 emission, it's the biggest one is come from the electricity and uh, the rest one is from the uh, oil refinery, transport and the industrial sector. So uh, regarding to the uh, net zero emission plan that have been published by uh, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, we have the nuclear on grid on 2049. And then uh, you know that the yellow one is the solar cell, which is a huge demand of the solar cell. It should be on the 361 uh, gigawatt. And then uh, you know that the battery energy storage system should also be increased on the 2030 and also the hydro. And then we have accelerating the hydrogen, the green one at here, uh, comparing to the bioenergy with this slide uh, at here. And you know that if we go to the net zero emission, the, the important things is the financial. The total requirement of investment should be one thousand one hundred seventy-seven billion US dollar. This is this is a huge uh, money also to be invested in Indonesia. And uh, the, towards the net zero on twenty sixty, the energy transition scenario would uh, must be uh, addressing like this. Uh, we have the priority issue of the technology the accessibility of the energy and also the finance, which is uh, the corridor of the energy security should be affordability, availability, accessibility, and acceptability. And of course, to accelerate the net zero, we need an international assistance to adopting high and sophisticated uh, technology accelerating the net zero. And of course, the Indonesia have a unique country, which is we have uh, the islands and the population growing is depend on the population at that area. The economy is also there. Therefore, we must think about the people center energy because uh, this is, could be the parameter to realize the energy transition toward modern energy for all. And of course, regarding to that situation, we must consider about the uh, decentralization of the energy scenario, which is uh, with a specific location with a close grid island. Meanwhile, the energy resources in local area can be put in a good use, especially for natural and living resources because Indonesia has so much biodiversity. And of course, a huge invest, uh, investment on the uh, renewable energy should make a multifunction economy, should uh, have a technology transfer. We must uh, available the research impact. We must have a uh, human resource development and, and we must create also the business on the energy se sector for uh, the supply chain on, on that area. And of course, uh, the technology increase uh, very fast. So we must, as a researcher, also should keep uh, the leap uh, towards the advanced technology, especially for carbon capture storage, for next generation of battery, the hydrogen technology, geothermal energy, and also the uh, green ammonia. Uh, 
our institution have a several recommendation to the government that Indonesia have a step forward to the uh, net zero. Uh, the policy is uh, become, uh, we must accelerate the biofuel program, which is the next year we will have a B40 and then co-firing on existing uh, steam power plant uh, based on the biomass or based on the hydrogen uh, base. And then the implementation of reduced derivative fuel also become important. And of course, the digitalization with the new and renewable energy such as geothermal, biogas, biomass, and etc. should be uh, counted. And then the industry should be thinking about the carbon capture storage right now for the utilization of the uh, CO2 and then uh, move to the other chemical. And government should uh, increase the electric vehicle uh, implementation based on the battery or based on another energy storage. And also in the next one would be uh, the fuel cell based. And, uh, you know, the, the PV rooftop of floating PV with the smart grid uh, also has become popular. So uh, the interconnection transmission should be uh, have a good uh, for the e-mobility on the next one. And the last one is uh, the implementation of blue and green hydrogen, especially for the utilization and the petrochemical industry, such as ammonia, uh, steel industry, petrochemicals, and also for the transportation. Talking about the hydrogen production, the hydrogen should come from the another resources. So we uh, divided at here if the hydrogen come from the natural gas, petroleum, and coal. Uh, we have we have the uh, brown and green hydrogen right here. And we, if we doing the carbon capture storage, we will have a blue hydrogen. And of course, if we produce a hydrogen from renewable, we will get uh, another green hydrogen. How about the transportation of the hydrogen? Uh, many people have uh, talked about the how to storage the hydrogen, and we must also thinking the transport. And if, if in a uh, long distance um, area, uh, we must uh, convert it to the liquid hydrogen. We can uh, produce the, uh, with the hydrogenation uh, process, we will have uh, the methyl cyclohexane is come from solvent. And then we also have the ammonia as the organic carrier of the hydrogen. And the utilization of hydrogen gas itself, it could be used by, uh, to the fuel cells. And then we can have, have a vehicle uh, if, we if we go to the direct combustion, we have power generation, and also uh, we have a stationary of fuel cells and so on. About uh, the ammonia, we can use it uh, with the indirect and also with direct uses. We can go to the combustion of the ammonia. We can go to the fuel cell and also for furnace. Talking about the cost of hydrogen right now, uh, we know already about the color right uh, before. Uh, and uh, if I put the prediction of the hydrogen cost right here, uh, roughly, uh, the highest price is on the green hydrogen we, because uh, the price of the uh, photovoltaics uh, now still higher, but not really higher, but it become uh, much more cheaper in the next uh, five or ten years. And and of course, uh, the cheaper one uh, from the uh, hydrogen production is a green one. We, we commonly use uh, here. And then if we invest the carbon capture stores, we will slightly uh, increase for the hydrogen price uh, at here. And talking about the roadmap of the hydrogen utilization based on the uh, utilization that have been published by Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources here, um, in, the 20, in the year of 2030, we will have the 328 megawatt of the hydrogen and then increase again. And then in 2040, we will have 27 times than before. It would be reached uh, nine gigawatt. And then uh, we have a bigger again, uh, six uh, times than before. Then we have 52 gigawatt at the net zero step. So dividing into the utilization of the hydrogen for transportation and then for industry, we can uh, see at this map, uh, the increase of the uh, fuel cell vehicle is start from 2030. And then, uh, of course, it is uh, would be increased parallel by the uh, battery electric vehicle. Then we will have uh, uh, three million of the the hydrogen vehicle in 2060. And of course, uh, the utilization of the hydrogen in industry. We can see this by uh, the color of hydrogen I put in here. We calculated that the green hydrogen is start on the uh, 2031 because at that time maybe. Uh, the price of the solar cell has become uh, lower than it would be economic uh, available in, the, in this year. And then we starting have uh, uh, the pink hydrogen at the uh, 2050. And for net zero, we only have a pink hydrogen and green hydrogen. And also in the research field, we have several topics of the research that starting from now, uh, it's become booming again uh, to do the research on the hydrogen and fuel cells uh, area. And of course, uh, now 
uh, many researchers are also doing the green ammonia research, and then they're starting to think about the hydrogen filling station and so on. You can see in this table. So, um, uh, according to the um, the research uh, field in the uh, Japan or even in the internationally, uh, they consider about the CO2 that might be useful in the future. So we will use, if we're capturing the CO2, uh, it is not uh, efficient if we uh, inject it again in the, to the earth, but we now must use the carbon capture storage and we collect the uh, CO2, concentrate it and use it to the others. So use it for the chemicals, use it for the fuels, mineral, and others. Uh, now it's already have abundance of the catalyst to convert the CO2 uh, with the hydrogen to become methane or become another uh, chemical. So uh, you know that the uh, while the hydrogen price is uh, decreasing, uh, we will see the uh, utilization of the hydrogen is increased. And the hydrogen would be not become just gas, but become a molecules. It means that uh, the industry need the hydrogen, we need the synthetic fuel, we need the ammonia, which is increasing uh, year by year like this. Uh, how about the map in Indonesia right now? We have so many feasibility study right now in Indonesia for the hydrogen project. And you know, many industry has come from Indonesia right now and have a study with the local company at here uh, to invest in, in Indonesia. Uh, we have Ocas, Ignis, Fortus, HDF, and also Pertamina get uh, with the GIZ, they uh, creating the hydrogen feasibility study. And we have also uh, probability, availability in the uh, new capital at Kalimantan Island at here we will have the hydrogen transportation and the hydrogen methane as a city gas. So this is a big opportunity in Indonesia right now. Uh, the next one, I will give you the example for the hydrogen project. This is uh, doing by Pertamina and GIZ. They produce the hydrogen from the geothermal site, which is uh, 8.6 kilogram of the hydrogen uh, production per day. We will see in this uh, last year. And uh, in the last week, I just come back from uh, Surabaya city. We have the ammonia, uh, for firing in PLN uh, in the Surabaya uh, Gersik. Yeah. And we have a, a demonstration of the co-firing of ammonia at here, uh, and the target would be a 20%. And this is the uh, small uh, uh, gift that I just come back from uh, the hydrogen filling station in, in Japan, and located at Chibako and Minatoku. This hydrogen that come to the uh, filling station is come from the excess of the industry. Uh, steel industry and petrochemical industry are located at Chiba Aira, then uh, have been liquefied and then uh, transferred to the uh, fueling station at the Tokyo City. So with this uh, example, we know that the hydrogen uh, car utilization now increased in, in Japan and they uh, have and in just one location of the hydrogen filling station, they have 50, uh, 50 fuel cell vehicle per day that uh, fueling the hydrogen in this uh, location. And for the research in, in Indonesia, Green now focusing research on biomass waste, the gasification of biomass to make a syn gas, to we accelerate the advanced material for the hydrogen storage, we developing a new catalyst, we developing the electrolyzer, and also we uh, thinking, starting to make the carbon capture from a bio, and then uh, we have also the biomaterials. And uh, regarding to this map, uh, we now we now have a feasibility study, how to make the electrolysis uh, from the electrical grid from Jawa Bali and to make the hydrogen at here, and we uh, calculating the contribution of the co-firing also uh, from the hydrogen. And also we have uh, advanced material that coming up from the coal industry, uh, to become a uh, battery uh, material. And of course the hydrogen storage, you can see at this map. And uh, because I'm talking about the decentralization scenario of the energy, uh, we now starting the project uh, with the several uh, collaboration for the international one and also the national one. We're doing the uh, biohydrogen production from uh, waste materials. We starting with the cocoa, we starting with the sugary metal, we starting with the pome, sago, and also algae. We have already experience on the pome, especially for the last uh, six years, and we developing the hydrogen uh, rich uh, gas production. And then in the plan, uh, in the next year, we will uh, try to make a gas engine a generator 
and uh, make the biohydrogen uh, combined with methane, and then uh, we uh, convert it to the electricity. So what is the key technology that we must uh, know? The te key technology is the fuel cells and electro electrolyzer. Uh, since uh, six, uh, 15 years ago, I'm also doing already uh, making the fuel cells with uh, my team, and then uh, we starting to make uh, electrolyzer also with the capability uh, until five kilowatt of fuel cells. Now we're doing it again, and then uh, we have also the to like we have a recommendation to the government that uh, Indonesia have must have a roadmap of hydrogen utilization to the industry and transportation, and then the roadmap of the local company of industry to make the key technology of fuel cells and electrolyzer, and also the roadmap of how to make the hydrogen to the molecules to become the chemical industry, to become the ammonia as the hydrogen carrier. So the last one is, uh, I want to know uh, the challenge in Indonesia. We have a big uh, gas supply in Sumatra Island, but we don't have the hydrogen highway at here. But we don't have the hydrogen highway at the uh, Jawa Island because we have a surplus electricity. And we have a big Cayenne River, Cayenne River in Kalimantan Island. So we have also uh, the fertilizer uh, industry at here and a methanol uh, production at here. So we can produce the hydrogen from the hydro and then convert it to the uh, to the uh, another chemical with the uh, combination of the nitrogen become the ammonia and so on. And we have also uh, a big uh, river in the Papua Island. This is the potential also to make the hydrogen uh, production from the hydropower and then making this is the Bintuni methanol uh, production uh, in this area. And in the East Indonesia, we have a, a huge intensity of the uh, solar power, so we can get the green hydrogen at that, and we, uh, and we can export also uh, the electricity to the others. So this is a nuclear power plant uh, that located uh, to be to, to be planned in in Jawa and Kalimantan. So thank you for the time uh, that I can talk in the winner uh, this day. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Professor Enya, for the for the presentations. Uh, I think uh, I would like to move on to the uh, next speaker. Uh, after uh, we ha we heard uh, the story about the development of uh, various technology in Indonesia with regards to the hydrogen, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Julio Cesar Garcia Navarro, who is an uh, hydrogen technology expert at the uh, New Energy Coalition Chrono, with over ten years' experience in the hydrogen space and with a, with a fast knowledge from a different hydrogen technologies across various different various chains. So Julio, uh, I give the floor to you. Good, uh, yeah, good uh, afternoon, uh, good evening. Are you, uh, uh, let me know if I'm not, uh, I'm not hearable. Um, so I guess, I guess it's all right. So yeah, um, yeah thank you for inviting me for this, uh, uh, yeah, for this event. My name is Julio Garcia, a little bit for short. I'm Mexican, uh, we have a, a very long name sometimes. Um, I am here to tell you a little bit about the, the um, some lessons we learned from the High Delta project. Uh, so this presentation will be titled Hydrogen Upstream and Downstream Economy in the Netherlands, Lessons Learned from the High Delta One project. Um, uh, who am I? I am the unit manager for hydrogen research at New Energy Coalition. New Energy Coalition um, is, a, is a Dutch institution. I'll, I'll get to that. And I am also the, the coordinator of the High Delta program. So moving on to, to this slide, uh, the, the mandatory, who are we here? Um, New Energy Coalition, we are a closer organization that is focused on the Northern Netherlands. Um, hence, we, we are at the center of, uh, of uh, the Heaven project. We were the ones who uh, who coordinated the, the development, who are, are coordinated the whole program. Um, we are an organization that uh, includes many partners across the Netherlands um, who are all interested in the energy transition. I work within a team called the Hydrogen Green Molecules Team. The Hydrogen Green Molecules Team is a research and, and project development team and that is active in many Dutch and many European projects. You can see here a few of them. You can see a, a project such as um, regarding hydrogen, but also regarding carbon capture, regarding uh, smart energy grids, uh, decarbonization of cities. So we are we are very active, needless to say, in in topics that are uh, that are around the, the topics of sustainability, about climate change. We are a closer organization that truly believes that that green power and decarbonization are the the only way in the future. 
So uh, a little bit about High Delta project. Um, you can see here a very nice map of, uh, of the Netherlands. Um, we are a research, uh, national research consortium that will, I want to click the next slide. We are a research consortium, a public-private cooperation between Dutch uh, research uh, bureaus, research organizations, and uh, Dutch stakeholders, uh, mainly the, the, the government. We are a government socialized uh, program, but we are also um, encompassing the, the gas transport industry. So we have Hasuni. Hasuni is, uh, is the largest, uh, well, the single uh, largest entity that transports had, uh, natural gas in the Netherlands. They, they have a lot of business importing and exporting natural gas. And we are also, uh, we are also in collaboration with Netbeheer Netherlands. Netbeheer Netherlands is a, is, a, is a lobby association that encompasses all of the gas network operators, both Hasuni and the, and the distribution operators. So the local, the local natural gas uh, uh, transporters that bring, the, that bring the natural gas to applications such as houses, to commerce, and to the small industry. The High Delta One project is a project uh, that is uh, um, that has a goal to research the economic and the safety aspects of using the existing natural gas infrastructure for the transport of hydrogen. Uh, the, the first uh, tranche, the first part of, uh, of the High Delta program, High Delta One, was a, a project that lasted 17 months uh, that had a, a, a relatively moderate budget for the, for the, uh, for the time, for the duration, 2.3 million euros. Um, we we produced a lot of knowledge, a lot of research results that have that have been catching the attention of both Dutch as well as international stakeholders. Um, and this is mainly because everyone is asking themselves the question: um, If I have infrastructure that used to be trans uh, for transporting natural gas, can I use it for hydrogen? And what are the barriers? What are the most important challenges that we need to overcome? The the focal points of, of our research. Um, towards uh, reusing the same infrastructure uh, to to a different purpose, to the purpose of uh, of transporting a low carbon uh, low carbon fuel such as hydrogen. I'm clicking on the next slide, and so this is uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the the summary of the main research results that we found. We found here these are the costs for for uh, hydrogen production and uh, transport, bringing the hydrogen to the Netherlands. You can see here the cost all around the world, the, the ex unexpected projection for 2030. Um, there we have focused on different parts of the world. There we, we didn't focus on, for example, Indonesia, but that's something that we would like to take up in the uh, in next uh, uh, parts of our research. And uh, we were looking um, at, the, at all the numbers at how much it would cost by 2030, by 2040. And we realized that green hydrogen can compete with gray hydrogen as early as 2030. Uh, we, looked, uh, we looked at the fact that the domestic production of green hydrogen, for example, in the Netherlands, is remarkably competitive to potential imports, which is very, very interesting for Dutch stakeholders because everyone, everyone was asking, OK, so let's, uh, probably, let's probably just import, right? Uh, the, the case for producing hydrogen domestically is probably doomed. We found that that wasn't really the case. I can imagine that for Indonesia, this is going to be even better uh, because of the, of the larger uh, uh, renewable energy potential that, are, that are, can be there, for example, for solar. Maybe there are uh, interesting parts for, uh, for wind power in Indonesia, but uh, we, we found that uh, we can definitely compete in, um, uh, in, 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 hydrogen, um, in hydrogen production and hydrogen development. So moving on, looking at the, the concept of value chains, um, this is very, uh, very important because um, we were thinking that, okay, if we have individual stakeholders, for example, industry, for example, mobility, uh, the built environment, if everyone individually were to say, okay, I want to go for hydrogen, then it is likely that they would have to develop their own transport infrastructure either depend on two trailers for getting the hydrogen, either they themselves uh, digging up the ground and installing natural gas uh, infrastructures. Um, and this is, this is what would be, uh, that, that would lead to, to large costs that would increase the total cost of hydrogen uh, delivered to a customer. But we thought, okay, what if we have a, we have a shared 
transport infrastructure. What if uh, now we have you have heard probably of the Dutch hydrogen backbone uh, of the development of the of a, of a large scale transport uh, network for hydrogen in the Netherlands that is meant to connect the five uh, industrial clusters in the country. Uh, we thought, okay, so we this is already going on. This is already under construction. What about the rest of the users? Uh, could could they be getting an advantage, a windfall by switching to hydrogen? And instead of developing their own network, if they connect to an existing network, if they just get an extension of the Dutch hydrogen backbone. And you can see here the results uh, that the, uh, both for the mobility and for the built environment, the connection to a shared transport infrastructure leads to leads to very, uh, very important decreases in the cost of the hydrogen delivered to them, which in the end is going to is going to help the business case for hydrogen. So it's not about developing uh, isolated uh, isolated uh, uh, users for uh, for consumption for production of hydrogen, but if everyone connects to a single infrastructure, we can definitely uh, we can definitely lead uh, to to a better business case for hydrogen. And so this is a little bit of what we did, but we also did uh, uh, work with regards to safety. What you can uh, looking at uh, what you're looking at here is this is how the, the natural gas infrastructure of the Netherlands looks like. It consists of three, three main parts, the high pressure transmission lines, HDL, the regional transmission lines, RTL, and the, and the regional uh, distribution networks, the RMB in Dutch. Um, what we were looking at, uh, we were focused on the distribution infrastructure. We were looking at the very low pressure pipelines, the pipelines that go all the way to the houses. And we were looking at what are the most critical, uh, the most critical safety aspects, because we we not only want this to be to be cost effective, but we want it to be safe. This is uh, the the uh, first and foremost um, uh, important thing to to have here. So what we were looking at, we were looking at there are two critical safety aspects that we need to pay attention uh, to, which is on the one hand the odorization of hydrogen. We were looking at uh, if the current natural gas odorant can be used for hydrogen, and the answer is yes, with no with no loss in uh, in effectiveness. So that's really positive. Uh, we can uh, the uh, people who are used to this, the current smell of natural gas will be able to identify hydrogen leaks by using the same smell. And on the other hand, if we look at the optimal ventilation um, in, for example, houses, if we are looking at how this currently works with natural gas and how this can work with hydrogen. Uh, we can ensure that hydrogen uh, leaks will not lead to explosive atmospheres, will not lead to, to fires, uh, meaning that if we, if we take uh, this into account, we will be able to have hydrogen at least as safe as we have now natural gas. And what uh, we found also that most of the components in the infrastructure are hydrogen ready. There are very little, very, very little requirements needed for replacing for replacing uh, or for maintaining this. And this is very good because it means that the hydrogen, net, the natural gas networks are more ready for hydrogen than we originally thought. Um, this is of course part of the discussion. Another part of the discussion is looking at, uh, at standards, looking at safety standards, the, the, the normativity uh, um, environments, both at Dutch, at national, but at international levels. And here, the main take-home message is that uh, to cover all the relevant safety aspects of hydrogen transport, we have to either uh, expand the current standards uh, that are covering natural gas to also cover hydrogen, but also uh, we, uh, we have to, if these are not available, to develop new hydrogen standards. This is luckily something that is going on, so it is important for us to keep on, to keep on uh, looking at what is the status there. How soon can we can we have uh, standards that can ensure that hydrogen is uh, is safe? Hydrogen is as safe as natural gas. And looking at how to introduce hydrogen to the gas grid, uh, what we were looking at is uh, okay. We uh, the government can have policy instruments to accelerate the the uptake of green hydrogen in the existing uh, industry as well as in new and upcoming industries. For example, mobility heavy duty mobility, for example, the built environment. So we were looking at the questions such as, could we start the development of pilot projects, 
pilot projects uh, not to demonstrate the feasibility of, of hydrogen because there are other platforms going on. For example, the Heaven project, from what I hear also in Indonesia, is already going on. But pilot projects to, to look at how it will work if the industry were to offtake hydrogen, uh, to generate hydrogen certificates, to trade these hydrogen certificates, what needs to be done before industry can start consuming hydrogen, replacing the existing natural gas consumption, and then using green hydrogen instead. It is, it is important that uh, we uh, not, uh, do not mandate the industry uh, overnight. Okay, you guys have to start using green hydrogen, start consuming green hydrogen, but rather that we introduce this in the form of pilots where we can look at uh, what regulatory schemes need to be in place to, to ensure a seamless transition, but also an accelerated transition towards uh, green hydrogen consumption. Um, these are a few of the, of the excerpts that you can find in the High Delta One Summary Report. If you are interested in the hydrogen value chains, if you are interested in hydrogen transport, uh, feel free to take a look. All of our research is free. It uh, has been uh, uh, published in our website, highdelta.nl. Uh, you can uh, look at, the, uh, look at the, 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 the main results if you want to have an overview of what it is we are researching, what it is we researched, what were the most critical findings? You can take a look at this report. If you want to get a, a deeper understanding of all the topics we covered, we covered many, many topics over the past 17 months. Uh, feel free to, to do so. Everything is on our website. Um, I encourage you to, to, have a, um, yeah, to have a look. And then as my, as my final slide, I can tell you about High Delta 2. That's the next step in High Delta program. Uh, High Delta 2 is going to focus on, uh, on, on topics such as the social acceptance of hydrogen, uh, the use of hydrogen to decongest the electricity grid. So hydrogen not only as an energy carrier, but also as a way to avoid having to invest in the electricity infrastructure, which is a critical, uh, a critical um, discussion in the Netherlands. Um, and also looking at uh, safety working procedures of the high and the low pressure networks, so it is not only about the, the components per se, it's also about the technicians. So how can we train the technicians that are used to working with, a hydrogen, uh, with natural gas to work also with hydrogen? This is uh, something that we are going to be doing in, in collaboration, for example, with the Hydrogen Valley Campus, with other human capital development um, initiatives in the country, where we think it is important to keep uh, everyone up to date with how, uh, with exactly what uh, what hydrogen can represent uh, in the economy, but also what things need to be taken care of uh, when it comes to to safety, to the safe handling of hydrogen, the safe transport of hydrogen, and and so forth. So that's uh, that's pretty much it. If you have any any further questions, you can uh, reach me. I'm the project coordinator of the High Delta program, um, J. Garcia at NewEnergyCoalition.org. Um, it is. Uh, it would be very interesting. I uh, would be looking forward to uh, to to discussing with uh, with Indonesian counterparts in case there are things that we can learn from one another. I'm sure there are. So I I, I think I would really encourage if you want to reach out, feel free to reach out. Uh, otherwise, you can have here the QR code for our website. Um, you can also follow us on LinkedIn.com uh, slash company slash High Delta. If you want to to be up to date with the, the recent developments in in our program, and um, so thank you very much, Bayou. Thank you very much to the winner session for having me. And um, yeah, I'm open for uh, for a discussion. Thank you, uh, Dr. Julio Garcia Navarro, for the uh, clear uh, presentations about uh, some aspect related to the hydrogen transport, particularly the study that you have uh, presented. And uh, I think we are uh, reaching towards the end of the session because we are kind of uh, running after the time. But I would like to invite all the uh, uh, participants to uh, to be on present because we would like to uh, pose some questions, very short one, because we only have uh, five minutes left, according to the uh, organizer. I would like to start with a very short question, uh, which is uh, directed towards uh, Professor Enya from the audience. Uh, one of the audience uh, has asked about one of your slides where you mentioned about the relation between biofuel and the hydrogen in the future, where hydrogen might be higher than the uh, biofuel. So then the question is, um, 
what do you think about the most advantages by utilizing hydrogen as a potential renewable energy selections compared to biofuels in uh, the energy resilience or achieving zero carbon emissions by 2060? That is the questions from the audience. Professor Aninia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof uh, Bayou, for, for that question. Um, I think uh, it should be discussed again, but uh, I think the disadvantages right now for, for biofuel is uh, about the supply chain, because uh, the, the problem uh, now uh, is uh, the supply chain and the feedstock of the bio uh, the bioenergy including the biofuels of course and uh, you know that the, the um, we the government of the minister of energy in indonesia they're thinking of the uh, energy plantation area i think that uh, if there is no area that uh, especially dedicated for the bioenergy so the biofuel cannot uh, reach uh, more higher than now. And then uh, why we put the hydrogen, it's much more uh, higher than even from biofuel. It is uh, because the, uh, the movement of the uh, photovoltaic uh, price is cheaper. And then the demand of the photovoltaic is a big in Indonesia and and this is have been discussed uh, by many ministers. And uh, we hope that from the 361 uh, gigawatt of until the net zero of 2060 uh, would be covered by a photovoltaic, which is uh, 10 times larger than geothermal also. And, and uh, this is the, the potential to get the green hydrogen. And uh, you know, delivered by Mr. Rahmat also, uh, the potential of the hydropower now has has been uh, created by uh, many industry that uh, want to build the hydropower in and even in Kayan River is a big one in Indonesia, and uh, the potential to use the hydrogen production from the hydropower is also has been addressed to be uh, higher. So I think right. uh, that's uh, two. That's one of the, the argumentations why it is hard. Yeah. So thank you, yes. Professor India. Mm -hmm. I think before before the end, I would like to make a, a, a bit of a closing remark and then as a short question to all of you, because we know that the uh, energy systems nowadays are based on a fossil fuel, which has contributed to the climate change through the greenhouse gases emissions. And as part of the commitment from the world through the Paris Climate Accords, every nation has to strive for the energy transition to a sustainable one, reliable and affordable energy systems. And the large use of hydrogen in our economies will call for a many uh, uh, redefinitions and redesigning of the energy value chain and development of a new economic and business models which have been uh, presented today. So now what I would like to ask very shortly before we close, just a, a short answer. Uh, when do you expect that the hydrogen economy will have a comparative size as the other renewable energy economies? You can think as a solar or wind. Uh, so you can try to say, well, during at this year, we will reach the same uh, level or the size. So maybe I would like to ask first in the Netherlands part, I would like to ask maybe Hirte. Well, by you pose a very difficult question, I think, and it almost reads like a, one of those football pools where we all call a number and whoever is right will get maybe a, a flask of wine or something. Uh, it's very hard to say for me because hydrogen currently is a very small component, I think, in the energy mix in the Netherlands, but uh, it has a very big focus, especially in politics. And I think politics is key here uh, to want to invest in hydrogen. I think it will go very fast now, but things have changed a lot, of course, on the European continent, also with the uh, situation in Ukraine currently, uh, which really made such a, a significant that we really need to have our energy systems in line and not depend too much on other uh, systems. So I think it might go very fast now. Um, 
but to say when it is exactly the same size, I think in the end the size has to match up with the renewables, of course, to take also congestion from the web, but I don't uh, want to call out a number and maybe... Uh, you complete. don't want to call out a number, right. That's, no. that's fine. Uh, pa Rahmat. Okay, uh, thank you. I think uh, all uh, renewables will be uh, complementary, especially for the uh, green uh, hydrogen can be uh, produced uh, from uh, maybe renewable energy. And also uh, one uh, of the problems with the electricity is uh, that uh, it cannot uh, be uh, safe. Uh, it can be safe in terms of the uh, uh, battery and also in terms of the uh, hydrogen and we believe that uh, with the process of the uh, transition energy especially for uh, diminishing utility of the coal uh, power plant uh, i think uh, all uh, technology renewable energy uh, especially for the solar uh, and also for the uh, hydrogen i think uh, it will be uh, complementary uh, to produce or to support the uh, sustainable uh, and reliable of the uh, electricity. I think it is the same with the uh, previous speakers. Uh, I cannot uh, answer right. the exact uh, question uh, about that one, but I think uh, the technology will uh, improve uh, together with all uh, other uh, renewable it, energy. It, it, okay. it will go uh, in a parallel. That's uh, what you're yeah. saying. Right, thank you. Uh, Professor Lorenzo, spin time. Yes, thanks, Bayer, for this question that allows me to engage in one of the favorite Dutch exercise, coffee dick kijken. Um, basically, looking at the bottom of the coffee cup and try to get a signal to know how to predict the future. Um, I assume that you are actually referring to when the hydrogen economy will achieve the same size that the other renewable economies have at the moment, because at the time that we will be there, hopefully this other renewable market will be uh, far ahead. And uh, if I um, take as a benchmark what we have seen a couple of weeks ago here in Groningen at the Windmill Gas Conference, which is one of the major gatherings that we have in the country to speak about hydrogen and how it develops, uh, we have seen uh, considerable investments taking place in a six-year time something that was to considered to be just a, a topic to discuss or the side of, uh, of event uh, such as the one where I am now uh, is changing into a reality to the possibility and I'm um, quite confident that over six years we will be speaking not of an hydrogen economy as a possibility but as a reality um, but I'm not there to say whether it will be a reality anywhere comparable to solar or wind energy or no. other renewable energy markets also because that, there is that a gives us a bit of a perspective. Thank you, uh, Professor Spintani. And a professor it was a big Nish. pleasure. And I to, unfortunately, I have to go because my connection is really falling down. Thank, <laughs> Bye, thank you, Professor Enia. Okay, uh, maybe I just uh, just want to add. Uh, uh, one short uh, uh, statement that uh, I think the the government we hope we do hope uh, the Indonesia government should fix uh, the roadmap of the renewable energy and then uh, the industry the industry uh, really need the the stability of the investment so I think it's uh, the government fixing the uh, roadmap this is uh, would be grow uh, would be um, would be good uh, uh, condition to make the local local industry also can be growing uh, to accelerate the uh, the energy, especially for renewable energy. Right. Okay. Thank you, Professor Nia. And Julio. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a, an interesting question. I can offer. Allow me to offer a a complimentary view. Yeah, a short one. Uh, yeah, very short. So uh, the I, I think uh, the hydrogen. Um, I wouldn't really uh, compare hydrogen with other renewable uh, power because in the end, hydrogen uh, is uh, is complementary to a renewable power. Um, you cannot have you cannot have green hydrogen without more solar panels, without more wind. So what I would say actually is uh, um, to to uh, uh, get the question on a different perspective is a thing that when hydrogen takes off, uh, I do I do agree that by the end of the decade, we might start seeing uh, something there. Uh, 
But when hydrogen takes off, this would actually mean that renewable power will take off even further because renewable power is now used to decarbonize local economies. So Indonesian solar power is uh, decarbonizing the Indonesian electricity grid. But then when, when green hydrogen comes, the Indonesian power could be able to decarbonize the German grid, could decarbonize the Australian grid. So this is the, something that something that hydrogen will, will uh, bring. Hydrogen will bring an acceleration of investments, also renewable power, uh, which means that by, by the time we have this conversation again in a, in, in a few years, we will have even double or quadruple the size of PV power just because of hydrogen. That's a, a, a very uh, good uh, remark from you, uh, Julio. And uh, I would like to thank again all of the speakers for uh, today's contributions. And I would expect that this is actually the starting point of a good uh, collaboration between Netherlands and Indonesia, in particular with regards to uh, sharing the knowledge and experience uh, between both countries. So again, I would like to thank also the audience and I wish you all a nice afternoon uh, to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.